Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Connie Weaver, who will talk with us about skeletal systems. Dr. Weaver is a distinguished professor and head of the Department of Nutrition Science at Purdue University. From 2000 to 2010, she was the director of the NIH, Purdue, University of Alabama Binghamton Botanical Research Center to study dietary supplements containing polyphenol polyphenolics for age-related diseases. Dr. Weaver's research interests include mineral bioavailability, calcium metabolism, and bone health. So I think the bone is the tissue that's been thought of to be important throughout the lifespan longer than the other tissues. So they have called osteoporosis a pediatric disease for many years, and I think cardiovascular and other things are just catching up. <laughs> Here's my disclosures. So to look at bone mass throughout the lifespan, you can see why it would be important during youth is uh, you acquire 40 to 50 percent of your adult bone mass uh, during, during these critical years of adolescence. And you arrive at a peak bone mass that is somewhat determined or largely determined by your genetic uh, uh, programming, maybe 60 to 80 percent of it. But the rest you can influence through lifestyle choices, diet and exercise. Then we hold on to the bone for a little while, it starts slipping down, but in the late, with menopause with women and a little more gradually with men, you start losing bone and that's where most of the research has concentrated on compared to the bang for the buck you'd get if you built more peak bone mass. It is an interaction between environment including diet and exercise and genetics for sure. Why is peak bone mass so important? 30 to 50% of children have at least one fracture by the end of the teenage years, so even fracture in childhood is important and you can modulate that with lifestyle choices. But then by adulthood, 50% of women and 20% of men over 50 will experience an osteoporotic fracture. The estimated annual costs exceed $18 billion a year in the US. Now this is a, a progress that has gender or sex differences. You can see the uh, differences in formation of peak bone mass between men get taller, larger skeletons, and women. And if you cheat the bone, the nutrients that are needed for building the bone, you're going to be, have some suboptimal formation of peak bone mass. And then when you start losing bone later, you slip into the fracture risk zone a little bit earlier. In childhood, 89% increase in fracture risk per one standard deviation below age and sex specific median bone mineral density. But it's really not bone mineral density that's the good marker during uh, growth in childhood. We often use bone mineral density because in adults, it has, there's a linear relationship between bone mineral density and risk of fracture. But it's sort of inappropriately applied for monitoring uh, bone health in children because bone mineral content is better, bone strength is even better than that. But a five to 10% difference in peak bone mass may result in a 25 to 50% difference in hip fracture later in life. How bones grow. We're really busy during childhood growing thicker um, spongy bones with greater circumference. So you do acquire more uh, bone volume during that time that contributes to strength. But the long bones, you have um, increased length and diameter, and it's this increase in diameter that confers such great strength. You have this geometric increase in bone strength with every uh, unit of increase of diameter compared to whatever you would do with bone mass changes or bone density within that. What drives it? Here's kind of a picture of some of the hormones as you get into puber that pubertal growth spurt. So if you mark menarche right here, you have 
the really active period of growth in females. Sex steroid hormones certainly play a role. You have to have an increase before you have this launch of menarche. And then you get enough estrogen going that you have epiphyseal closure of the long bones and you stop lengthening or getting taller at that point. Um, and so the bone mineral content velocity really relates. It goes up with that increase in estrogen, but then you get so much the long bones close and then it falls off. But the greatest predictor that our lab and others have found for bone acquisition is IGF. It's really about growth or the regulators of growth or with genetics, I always think you better be looking for growth genes instead of something else because that's what's programming your bones to grow. It's never the homeostatic regulators like PTH or vitamin D. The things that you learn are controlling calcium homeostatically. That's never coming out in the model. And if you have IGF in the model, your um, sex steroid hormones fall out because it's just so dominant at predicting. We've always worked with the philosophy that these periods of rapid change in bone mass are probably the most important for interventions like diet and exercise. So during puberty, when you're getting 40 to 50% of your bone mass, that's a period of really high bone turnover. And unfortunately, so is menopause with women for the first three to five years and then it slows down. So we concentrate on those periods. But in fact, there's been no head-to-head -head studies showing an intervention at this stage in life versus earlier versus later or around the menopause or later. So it's really a guess that ought to be uh, determined analytically and that would probably require an animal mo model given the length of the grants in human uh, situation. One of the things that I want to point, that events that happen that I want to draw your attention to that's a new, fairly new publication in 2016 is National Osteoporosis Foundation convened a writing group that worked for two years on a position statement on predictors of peak bone mass. So the writing team is here. A couple of us are in the room. Taylor Wallace and myself, this was a wonderful group to work with. And we essentially did nine systematic reviews and uh, wrote this treatise. Don't just print out <laughs> that article before you know how long it is. But here gives you the summary of the kinds of things you would find in there. We went through all the macronutrients, the micronutrients that might be relevant, um, and then into physical activity and other predictors and summarized. We did a systematic uh, search since 2000, the last uh, NOF position paper on peak bone mass. And this shows you the numbers of types of articles there have been on these different predictors since 2000. So we graded them also and gave the strength of the evidence. And the two factors that got A-level strength of evidence, calcium with 16 randomized control trials, four perspective, four observational since 2000 and a bunch more before that. And then the other A factor was related to physical activity. So we looked at food patterns, not very much on that in children. Uh, alcohol smoking and physical activity, I would think ultimately there's going to be a stronger uh, body of literature on bone structure, but the tools to look at bone strength and bone structure are rather new. So we don't have nearly as many studies as for bone mass and bone density, which received a grade A. So moving along from growing this mass in circumference, now go, slipping into the other stage of the lifespan, when as you get older, you have a thinning of the bone and a widening in the circumference. 
So to make up for that thinning, that increase in geometry helps protect us, but not nearly enough. That's why one in two women over the age of 50 is going to get a fracture. And the incidence of fracture dwarfs all those other diseases you're talking about. If you look here, how many fractures we get compared to stroke, heart attack, or breast cancer. But we worry about these because we're always talking about mortality. But if you want to talk about quality of life, hip fractures will make you less sociable, in lots of pain, takes away your life um, style as much as any of those things, and it costs our health care assistance. So we ought to pay more attention to fracture. Osteoporosis is the thinning of bone from chronic drawing on that bone for the nutrients it needs to sustain the homeostatic levels of calcium and nutrients in the blood. And it thins until you get these thin trabeculae that snap when you have some force applied against it. We don't have a cure for osteoporosis. You can't go from this state and re-knit it and go back to this normal healthy state. All we have are uh, attempts to uh, reduce additional loss and stop the uh, progression of the disease. That's why prevention with diet and exercise is so important. So women may lose 15% of their bone mass in the first five years after menopause. The proportion of the population is in, that are over 80 years is increasing and is projected to triple between now and the year 2015. The overall prevalence of osteoporosis and related fractures will likewise increase. And this is a sex difference disease. We can't forget about men, but 80% of those hip fractures are in women. And so here are um, the latest data that were accumulated that's on the website of National Osteoporosis Foundation. Um, so, hmm. <laughs> um, so here shows you the incidence due to um, different subgroups that was reported uh, in JBMR fairly recently. So 15.8% of white females, 3.9% of white males, 7.7% of African American females, 1.3% of African American males, 20.4% of Mexican American females, and 5.9% of Mexican American males. So it is a sex difference and a racial difference as well. Here's prevalence data from that article I was telling you about by Wright in 2014, which is the most up-to-date prevalence story in the U US, showing a total of 53.6 million who have osteoporosis and low bone mass. So the predictors, you may know already, are genetics, diet, exercise, hormones, and the clinical risk factors relate age over 65, low body weight, family history of fracture, that's the genetics, and a history of postmenopausal fracture, including vertebral fracture in the person themselves, as well as genetic factors. There's also a country difference. This lines up the 10-year probability of hip fracture in women over 65 with prior fracture and DEXA T scores less than the classical definition of osteoporosis, minus two and a half standard deviations. So you have um, uh, this range from Denmark to Turkey and everything in between, and that has generated lots of speculation about what about the chosen lifestyles, forgetting their habits and genetics that interplay in there. Well, what are the current treatment options? Hormone replacement therapy was the mainstay of osteoporosis treatment and prevention for every menopausal woman until the Women's Health Initiative study that showed a risk of heart disease, stroke, and breast cancer. So it dropped from the major recommended treatment to um, bisphosphonates. And those are really good drugs to help 
protect against additional loss of bone. They don't build bone, but they can protect quite effectively against additional loss. But there's some rare side effects that worry physicians and patients linked to atypical fractures and osteonecrosis of the jaw. So my mother, for example, would go to her dentist, needed a tooth extracted. She was on uh, bisphosphonate. No, I won't touch your tooth until I sent him about a foot high stack of articles <laughs> about um, the evidence. And finally, he gave in and extracted her tooth. But what if you didn't have an advocate that knew the literature? So they have to struggle about that. Lifestyle choices still, calcium and vitamin D are the most uh, advocated and diet constituents and weight-bearing exercise. Calcium is a bone building nutrient. It's the major mineral in bone. And 70% of our calcium in the diet comes from dairy. So to Penny's recommended fruits and vegetables, I would add dairy for many tissues. Vitamin D in the US, we're fortunate dairy is fortified with vitamin D because that will bring you the hormone that helps you increase your absorption of calcium. There's much confusion in the literature about the relationship of calcium, dairy, and bone in adulthood. Not so much in children, but in adulthood. And some of the reasons are um, general difficulties with running randomized controlled trials, poor compliance, and the baseline status in randomized controlled trials is typically not considered. They may be already adequate in calcium and vitamin D, so if you give them more, it doesn't help. The methods for assessing their usual intake are very weak, not unique to a bone pro the bone field, but that's true. And then there are life stage sex and genetic dependent factors that I've mentioned briefly that often confound the results. I like to show this slide from the Women's Health Initiative because it really puts the thumb on the pulse of the issue of why sometimes people report no relationship and sometimes a large benefit. If you take all 68,719 postmenopausal women in the Women's Health Initiative that were randomized to calcium plus vitamin D, this shows you the relative risk of um, hip fracture, myocardial infarction, heart disease, cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, and death. There is no significant benefit uh, to hip fracture in this very large study from calcium and vitamin D. There's also no risk, in fact, a benefit to heart, by the way, which is a, a currently promoted risk factor by some. But the women in the women's health initiative were not asked to stop taking their own supplements. So many of the subjects were taking enough calcium and vitamin D that their mean intakes were about the recommended intakes of calcium and vitamin D. And there was a wide range of compliance. So if you take the reanalysis that Ross Prendis did, where they had to be compliant at least 80%, and they weren't taking their own vitamin and D and calcium supplements in that trial, then look at that whopping benefit calcium and vitamin D had over five years on lowering hip fracture. Now you have a hazard ratio of 0.22. That's really impressive. Again, no problem with heart disease. Now if you put Ross Prentice's reanalysis into a meta-analysis, then you have an overall benefit from the literature of a decreased risk of hip fracture by 30% in um, this meta-analysis. But even stronger than meta-analysis, I think, are basic structure function. If you look at the mineral constituent of bone, 36% of it is calcium, um, and that is a, a constant. It mostly comes from dairy products. You have a loss every single day that you can, your body can't synthesize. How are you going to replace it? There are ways to replace it, but Americans don't use the replacements very often. So milk provides you all the bone um, co uh, constituents and additional nutrients to for every living tissue. 
You can get calcium otherwise. Can you get all the constituents in dairy? Yes, maybe. The source matters, but intake matters more. So a prudent recommendation is the dietary guidelines suggest three cups of low-fat dairy products or equivalents a day. So every one you miss, get 300 of milligrams of calcium, which is in one glass of milk or a cup of yogurt, some other way, in a fortified food or in a supplement. Pay attention to your diet. So overall, building peak bone mass and reducing bone loss later in life are two strategies to reduce osteoporosis. Increasing peak bone mass by five to 10% can reduce fracture risk substantially. Lifestyle choices can modify both peak bone mass and bone loss. Several of the essential nutrients important to bone are shortfall nutrients as identified by the Dietary of Guidelines of America, for Americans, i.e. calcium, vitamin D, and magnesium. So we need to pay attention to those. So a bone healthy diet, calcium rich foods like dairy, fruits and vegetables, whole grains. It'll maximize peak bone mass, minimize bone loss, and promote overall health. Thank you.